Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is Bud Mopper for Cosmonauts Tip of the Month. And what I'm going to discuss today is my method for preparing a two structure to receive a composite resin veneer. And what I'm going to try to show you is how I keep the convexity of whatever tooth I'm working on and so that I get a uniform layer and in a, an attempt to keep everything in enamel and yet leave enough room uh, so that we have plenty of room to get the working properties of the material to give us the aesthetics that we want. So what you're seeing here is my attempt at a depth cut, and, and this is a 6862 diamond by Brassler. And you can use any flame-shaped diamond like this, and this is about one millimeter thick, and I usually sink it into about eight-tenths of a millimeter, leaving a little excess of the diamond. And what I will do is I'll follow the convexity of the tooth, from incisal to gingival, and you can see me as I move the burr, I'm working the tip into the gingival area. When you go into the tip, that'll give you about a four tenths millimeter uh, preparation for the cervical margin, and at the incisal, you'll have about eight tenths of a millimeter. So it'll be anywhere between three tenths and, and eight tenths of a millimeter from incisal to gingival. So this will give me my depth cut, and it'll really be a convex depth cut. If you look down the incisal edge, you can see the death cut really follows the convexity of that tooth surface. So I know exactly where I'm going to prep to and how much tooth surface I'm going to remove. Then I'm going to go from one side of the tooth to the death cut, erasing out the depth cut, and moving the burr from incisal to gingival, and I tip it so that I cut it the wider area at, at the incisal down towards the tip of the burr as I tip it towards the gingival, so I follow the convexity of that tooth erasing out the depth cut. And you can actually see it, the motion. And, and a, as I do that, I will take the tip into the interproximal, not the whole burr into the interproximal, so I can reserve the integrity of the incisal edge. Once I've done that, I have one side removed, and this is, it can be done either with a high-speed handpiece or an electric handpiece running at, at 40,000 RPMs underwater, and the amount of water you use is, is determined by the operator, but you want to have enough water spray so that you keep the thing clean and cool. Now, once I've got that mesial half of the two surface removed, I'm going to prepare the distal surface, and I'm going to do it in the same manner. And I will tip it from incisal to gingival, okay? And so that I follow the convexity of the tooth, and you can see the angle of the burrs, and I will erase out that depth cut. My next thing is to define the margin beneath the free margin. And here I use a retraction instrument. It can be an 8A instrument, a chrome instrument, anything that will protect the tissue from the burr. If you want to, you can pack retraction cord prior to your preparation or after your preparation. I just want the gingival tissue in impeccable condition, and that usually keeps from having any type of problem at all with seepage or, or bleeding. If we do, then we might have to use retraction cord, or we might have to use an astringent of some kind. Because I want to have a margin to sculpt to so that I can get perfect margination down there. If I don't prep that area down there, I find that I can leave flash very easily. I always want to take it about three tenths of a millimeter beneath the stream margin, and I would advise anybody out there that they should be using at least three and a half broad field spectrum optics so that they can see, because you can't see really with a two and a half X optic as well as you think you can. But when you get to the higher magnification, you can see every detail. And again, we're finding the convexity here from mesial to distal, maintaining the total convexity and the total shape of that tooth under underwater. What you're seeing in this next slide is I know that I, I want to add a little incisal guidance and so in order to do that I have to wrap the lingual surface. I can't just add a piece of material on the incisal edge and incisal lingual line angle and expect it to stay. If I want that to hold up and work long term then I'm going to have to prepare the lingual surface and that's what I'm doing because I'm going to wrap that incisal edge and I'm doing this with a OS1 diamond and uh, you can use any type of bird back there that you can get a, a prep that will give, give you what you're looking for. So we look at it from the labial. That's basically the way the tooth looks from the labial. From the lingual, you can see where the prep is. You could have taken that all the way across, and I really didn't need to, because that's the area where I'm going to add it. But I need to wrap that incisal area to get good resistance and retention for them. If you look down the surface, you can see that there's plenty of room now to add our material 
and to do what we have to and yet keep it in alignment. If you take a look, you can see how the convection and the shape has been maintained and so that we're going to get a uniform layer and a uniform thickness all the way across. Now, if you look at the etched surface of this tooth, this is after etching, okay, I placed my uh, phosphoric acid, you can see that the entire prep is in the enamel surface. That's what we're attempting to get. Sometimes we don't get it, especially in canines, but you can see I would manage to keep my prep entirely in the enamel surface, and that's what we're looking for. <laughs> at the next tip of the month, we're going to show you the different materials we use in our layering technique. The real uh, material that really counts in changing the overall color is the hybrid layer, the microhybrid layer. And we're going to show you how we apply it and how we, we adapt it and how easily it is to get what you're looking for very rapidly. So we look forward to seeing you at our next tip of the month.